We have our Lenten journey together, and the Sermon on the Mount provides us an ample view, if you will, of an invitation to a journey. So where is this particular setting? So the first one in the sermon series is always a little longer because we've got to figure out where we are and where we're going. Well, the Sermon on the Mount is exactly what it sounds like. Jesus climbed up to a mountaintop that was overlooking a valley, because that's where people have, and you shout, and he's teaching. I know there's some depictions of Jesus on this cute little thing underneath a tree where he's like talking to a bunch of people, and you can't talk to a few thousand people without a megaphone. So there's this echo effect, and so you get these like short bursts, and you're like, this doesn't read well. Well, it doesn't read well because it wasn't taught that way. It's like, blessed are the poor in spirit. What? <laughs> blessed are, yeah, like, that's literally what's going on here. You know, the guy next to you is trying to have a conversation about his ghost, and you're like, shut up, I'm trying to hear. I only get one shot at this. It was chaotic. It was repetitive. They're trying to understand what's being taught. This is where the feeding of the 5,000 starts trickling into the conversation. There's a lot of people there. And they're trying to understand why. Why are they attracted to this Jesus? Well, so the Galileans were interesting people. Nobody really liked them. The Romans hated them because they couldn't control them. They weren't in the cool kids club, right? So they're kind of like your plumbers, your electricians. They're, they're the middle class folks, right? Yeah, they might run a business or two, but they're not in the upper echelon. They're not sitting with the emperor's people. They're, they're just, they're, the Galileans are hanging out. Well, Romans don't like them. The other Jews didn't like them either because the problem with Galilee is also its best gift. So Galilee is kind of like the port of New Orleans in a lot of ways. You got some Spanish people, you got some French people. You like, there was a, a, a cosmopolitan port that was right there that when you entered into that port of Galilee, that's where all the trade goods headed out. So you had people from Persia, you had people from the Far East, you had Africans that would come through. And of course, people would fall in love and get married. Well, guess who you probably married? A Galilean. Well, you're not totally Jewish. You're kind of like, eh, seven, eight Jewish. So even the Jews didn't like the Galileans because, you know, you weren't Jewish enough. You didn't get the right Jewish family. Well, you kind of married in, but you're not really a part of us. It made them feel very much lost as a people. The Romans are not exactly the kindest occupiers, and then once the Jewish authority got in cahoots with Rome, they weren't the most kind folks either. They're looking to belong somewhere. They don't even feel like they belong in their own synagogues on Sunday. And so Jesus is encountering these nomads, essentially, they don't fit in socially anywhere. Their religiosity is being questioned. Their faith is being questioned. They're genuinely people that are doing Google searches looking for an answer. And the best that they can find is this teacher who seems to care about them, to walk among them. See, it's a key point here because in the span of how most rabbis worked, they would not walk with the people. There's actual bridges in Jerusalem. They walked above the people so they wouldn't have to touch them, right? They would go get their nice bath, and then another nice bath, and then another, and they would walk across the bridge to the temple where they wouldn't accidentally touch anybody because they don't want to become unclean, which is why I find it hilarious when a TV preacher goes, I can't fly first class. There might be somebody infected with the devil next to me, so I need my own private plane. I'm like, oh, oh, you're pulling that card. Okay, yeah, yeah. That, nobody's done that before. There's this Jesus who seems to want to be a part of their lives. And it causes them to follow him out to this field, out to this mountaintop. And there's this idea of mixedness. You might have heard this phrase from 
several 1940s propaganda, you're not pure enough, not good enough, because you're mixed with those people. You're not like us. They were not eligible to enroll in rabbinical school. They weren't eligible to move up in government. They weren't invited to the parties. See how I snuck that in there? <laughs> but it's true. The invitations would go out. Oh, you're the good one. Uh, oh, you're the good one. Uh, you're the good one. And everybody would look around and go, what about me? Ah, you married that Ethiopian. <laughs> no, 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 no. No, no, no. We're, we're, you're going you're gonna to live with whatever decisions we make as a group, and you'll be fine. When your own priests start to reject you, you wonder whether or not you should have faith in anything. Because if the teachers say that you don't belong and the priests who you're trying to find redemption to say you don't belong, then who is going to give you the invitation? That's why there's so many parables about Jesus inviting people to the wedding feast, to the party, to the party. That's why the party theme is over and over. Jesus is inviting people to the table, to the party, to the wedding feast. Because these folks weren't invited. They weren't invited. So Luke has a version of the Sermon on the Mount, and, and he has a list of four. Back to the whole shouting thing. Luke's like, who can remember what was there? Remember, Luke wasn't there. He's the stenographer, right? He's, this happened post whatever. Luke's going back like a reporter going, what did anybody say? And Luke's got four. And that's all they can remember people shouting, right? Matthew's got a little bit more because Matthew's disciples were kind of there. But it's still choppy. Still very choppy, because again, we're on a mountaintop. It's not a lecture, not like this. They didn't get the boring version. They just got shouted at. I can shout if you want. That can work, too. But anyway, so they're getting shouted at. And so Matthew takes them and spiritualizes them and starts combining what Jesus was going out into these groups. So you have the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus is shouting to people. But remember... Jesus is walking out amongst the people as well. Just as you walk out and want to talk to me in the narthex or whatever, people would pull Jesus to the side and go, what's going on with this? And he would give them a teaching. He would give them a saying. He would give them a piece of encouragement. And so Matthew's taking all of these shouted things and then, what does it mean to be this and that? And then Jesus would expound on it. And so that's how you get this Sermon on the Mount. It's not verbatim. It's not like, oh, Jesus said this and this means this. Yeah, it's an amalgamation. It's a, you have to take a step back and look at the overall theme. These are the four. These could have been the four that Jesus really shouted out to people. Blessed are you who are poor. Blessed all of you who are poor. Blessed are you who are hungry. Blessed are you who will weep now. Blessed are you when people hate you. Got to pause. Exclude you. Got to pause because the echo. Revile you and defame you. It carries different. It settles different. Being blessed is an honorific value. How honorable, how full of honor, how honor bringing. In other words, you bring honor to the table. Remember that one where the dude sits at the head of the table and the Jesus is starting to talk to them about who should, hit, who should sit at the head of the table? And then when the master walks in and goes, hey, you're in the spot for my dude. Get up and go embarrass yourself because <laughs> I've got the guy who really should be sitting at that table. There's a lot of honor language that's hidden behind the scenes of our texts. Galileans had no honor. There was no honor. You married an Ethiopian. You didn't honor the Jews. You should have married a good Jew. No, a really good Jew. Perfect Jew. Ah, but you married that, that Persian or the second generation Persian. 
They're not bringing honor to us. They were dishonored. When you don't get invited to a party, how do you feel anything other than dishonor? Not being honored, you're being dishonored. And so when Jesus says the word blessed, you have to replace the word blessed because you're like, I don't understand how blessed it is to be hungry. It's not. It's a bad translation. It doesn't really work. It doesn't make sense. How am I blessed when I'm hungry? How am I poor when I'm hungry? First of all, you're always blessed, so let's get that out of the way. Okay? Everybody's always blessed. But it means you have honor when you're hungry. It means you have honor when you are poor. It means you have honor when you are suffering. You are honorable. And that changes the lens. Because we think blessed means I'm going to get a private jet, right? I'm blessed. I got the lottery ticket. It's one of the worst used words in our, our, our Christian lexicon. How are you doing? I'm blessed. That means nothing. You're always blessed. Stop it. <laughs> I'm blessed too. I'd rather hear an honest answer. How are you doing? I'm, not, I'm kind of struggling today. Ah, now we're living in good community because we're being honest with one another. It's a bailout word. The idea of bringing honor to everyone. It's an interesting idea that Jesus is bringing about. It's the idea of lenses. The Romans didn't want to look through a Galilean lens. Why? They're poor. They're destitute. They have to work with their hands. We get to eat four times a day. Maybe five if we want to just keep doing it over and over again. Because we've got plenty of food. Who cares? The Jews, we have our rituals, we have our things, we have our way of being. We don't want to change. We like our stuff. Anybody who wants to come from the outside needs to just, oh, wait, stay, up, stay on the outside. But there's a lens to life. There's a lens to seeing one another. So every year we usually have a, I don't know, household family meeting. COVID killed that this year. Then five other things happen. And so what usually happens when you don't have a serious conversation for two months is you, you have it all at once, right? And there's a unique thing about how my wife and I operate because supposedly, according to Google, we're a power couple, right? I'm a big thinker, big picture person. I can put Legos in pieces and places where nobody can do it. And my wife's a very detailed, organized, methodical person, which means we're supposed to work great together until you have us actually work together because it doesn't work because of how she folds laundry. And I don't understand why she does that. And then it just doesn't work. And so we have a compartmentalized kind of thing that works where, you know, and this all started because I was cleaning the house, and of course, because I'm trying not to get everybody sick, and of course, I put a bleach rag into a pile of clothing that should not have had a bleach rag touch the pile of clothing. I know this now. <laughs> I know this now. And we're sheet shopping next week. <laughs> But there was a moment in the conversation where we both realized that we were not seeing the same thing through each other's lenses. We were only seeing things through our own lens. Sheets were very important, conserving things, not wasting money, not wasting things that we should be taking care of. That's very important to her. Me, on the other hand, I'm like, I got things to do. This thing ended up in the wrong thing. Yes, I'm sorry. How do we fix it? How do we do this and whatever? And so, it, it, I don't know, you, you've had these conversations where you're talking past one another, right? After an adult timeout, we suddenly started realizing that we both were saying the same things through each other's lenses. There's, there's values. There's values that go beyond the static situation. 
We both value the same things. It's also why we don't do dishes at the same time. Because I cannot see for the life of me. You ask me to load dishes, I'll load dishes. We didn't grow up with a dishwasher in my house. When I was an adult, I had a dishwasher. I put things in a dishwasher, I run it. Apparently, there is the right and the wrong way to load a dishwasher, and I miss this class in undergrad and grad school, okay? And I have had to suck it up over the years, and I mean suck it up, because I used to take it personally. I'd load in the dishwasher, and I load it, and it's fine. And of course, I hear the <sighs> And of course, I instantly go to 10. What? What is wrong with the dish? The things are in there. Well, this this will touch this, and this will vibrate, and this might chip that, and this will. Like, they're gonna get clean. It'll be fine. And so I genuinely tried to learn. Not happening. I can't see it. I can't see it because every time you get a new set of dishes, there's a new set of variables, and they stack in a different way. There's no there's no formula for me. So what do I do? I put them all in the dishwasher and I just leave it hanging open because I know it's going to happen. I pass through and she sees something I don't. I can't see it. I just can't. She'll quietly move two or three things. I've learned to breathe quieter while she's doing it. And then I go, thank you. Because I had to take the realization that I don't I can't see it. I am colorblind. I am colorblind. I go to Sherman Williams. I would like SW153, please. You want blah, 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 gray. Nope. I want SW153, please. <laughs> Whatever that number is, that's what I want. You trying to match it? I need SW153. That's what I need. I can't see certain things. I need other people to see things for me to help me be better. As much as I have tried, not throwing my wife under the bus, she'll say the same thing. I've tried to teach her to read a P&L. She wants to know how the business is doing. I'm like, here's a balance sheet, here's a P&L, here's our in and outs, here's this, here's the prospective five year. And she looks at the sheets of paper and she's like, I don't know what any of this means. It means we're not going bankrupt, but how do I know that? What's on the paper? It's right here, line 72. She just can't see it. What's important to her is can we pay the bills on time? Are we not getting in too much debt? Like, those are her values. And those values start driving how you interpret and see things. I can look at a P&L in five minutes and say whether or not we're doing good or bad. I just kid. I see it. It does make me grieve that some of our friends who had a contemporary service are no longer here. They had a lens. They had a unique lens. Right or wrong, we lost that lens. And you had a lens. It's a unique lens. And I grieve for them because they don't have your lens anymore. We're better because we can be with people and partner with people that it makes it hard to be a power couple because power couples create conflict. I wasn't here for all the details. But part of the discussion that we're going to have over the next few months is we're going to start a contemporary service. Don't ask me when it's going to happen. <laughs> I don't know. When Jesus wants, right? <laughs> and they will have a lens. And we will have a lens. And together you become a power couple in between the squabbling, because they're squabbling. Because that's what it's like living in a community. Which is why I don't believe in making choices. I hate making choices. And this comes to a larger conversation that makes, <coughs> pardon me,
that makes living together possible. And those of you who have been married for a long time, perhaps you can identify this particular aspect, whether you've done it or not, you clearly had to have done it. And this is what I mean by I don't like making choices. If you know what your priorities and goals are, and you're like, we're going to Alaska. That's your goal, going to Alaska. Somebody gives you a train ticket, and one of those train ticket destinations goes to St. Louis, and the other one goes to Florida. Which one do you pick? Both of them really nice places. But you don't really have a choice, because what's the goal? Alaska. Which one gets you closer to Alaska? St. Louis. So do you have a choice? No. Now you're in St. Louis. You get a plane ticket. One goes to New York. One goes to Mexico. Aha. What's the goal? Got to get to Alaska. How many flights go from New York to Alaska? How many go from Mexico to Alaska? Do I really have a choice? No. Because I've already plotted the destination. It makes all of the other choices non-choices. Did we really have a choice whether or not we were going to put doors in at the Learning Center? No, we didn't have a choice. What was the goal? We're going to do it. We're going to do it right. We're going to do it legally. We're going to do it the best we can. There's your value. There's your destination. So do you really have choices after that? No, just tell me where I got to go. Tell me what I got to do. How many times does Dick have to call the Chevy Building Department? When Jesus starts talking about the kingdom of heaven, it aligns every choice anyone ever has to make. What's your goal as a married couple? We're going to combine our wealth and be happy. <laughs> Good luck meeting that destination. When your destination changes on a whim because you're not happy, or because you're in a static situation, maybe you're in the middle of COVID. You know how many people got divorced during COVID? They had no destination. Then they had to sit home and talk to each other. Ooh. You don't get a lot of choices. Because your choices are made for you by your values and what's important and what your destination is. It also makes it a lot easier. Everybody used to make fun of Steve Jobs. He'd wear the same sweater and the same pants every day. Want to know why? He didn't want to make choices. Because if you have to make hundreds and hundreds of choices a day, the least amount of choices you make means those choices become more and more powerful. Who cares what you wear? I know some of you disagree with that. That's fine. My Sunday wardrobe's really easy. You don't know this, half the time my socks don't match. You don't see, you don't care. <laughs> I'm not gonna take 10 minutes rummaging through my sock drawer to find the perfect socks to match with my all black outfit. I won't wear white, I know that. But I want that 10 minutes to do the thing I wanna do downstairs which is spend time making coffee for my wife and hanging out with the kids in the morning. That's my five, 20 minute destination. Between five and 20 minutes in the morning, that's the priority. Somebody's calling me. Don't care, it goes to voicemail. Don't have to make a choice, because that's my priority. When we sit down for dinner, what's the value? And we sit, and we talk, and we be with one another. We've had to throw our phones in the kitchen. I take my watch off. Am I grumpy about it? Say it with me. Yes, I am, because I want to look at my phone, right? Well, if you don't like the choice, you know what? I don't have to like the choice. I want the destination. I don't have to like the choices on the way to the destination. I want the destination. I don't want the choice. Because if my destination is to pull out my phone and play with it at dinner, then we have to have all kinds of different destination conversations. If you start with the ending, oh wait, sorry, okay, yeah. Start with the ending. 
then everything along the way becomes much more navigatable. Did I say it was easy? No. But it makes it easier to understand the hard choices. It makes it easier to understand the process. And it makes that big, gigantic pill that I got to take to get this out of my brain easier to swallow. What's my destination? I want to feel better. You got to gargle with salt water. <laughs> I hate salt water. And as my wife, as good as she is, she's also a <laughs> because she knows what the sermon's about. She's like, start with the destination. <laughs> she's right. It's not a fun experience, which is why I get frustrated if I don't get to my destinations. Because if I'm going to pay the price and I'm going to have all these choices, and some of these choices are not fun. The goal is to get to the destination. Which is why I don't really believe in making choices. I think I believe in making destinations, and the choices are kind of made for you. And then it's your job to stay focused on those choices that lead to the destination you want to get to. I think it was funny this morning, you asked me whether or not to lead the candles, and I said some smart alley thing, like, subsection two, seven to three. Like, <laughs> my goal is to have the best worship experience possible. Do we light the candles? Do we not light the candles? <laughs> if it gets us to the destination, awesome. If somebody wants to put five candles up there next week and it helps us get to a better place of worship, put five more candles up there. Have at it. Have at it. It's not that I don't care. And that's the thing. Oh, he didn't care about those choices. No, I, I care deeply about the destination. And how we kind of get there is, eh, it's not quite all roads lead to Rome, but a good amount do. So during this Lenten journey, the destination is Easter. That's easy. Just fall asleep for 46 days, you'll be there. I would like to think that the B attitudes, what attitude do we want to be? What kind of people do we want to be? What kind of a church do we want to be? Somebody says, where do you go to church? I go to Chevy at United Methodist Church. What does that being mean? That being tells people a lot about how we see Jesus. It's a fascinating song. The original Lenten song I was going to pick didn't work out. Doesn't matter. In your uh, bulletin, there's a wonderful, like, Come Ye Sinners about the hymn. I didn't know half of this. It's kind of cool. If you have your hymns with you, we can open up to 340. If you look inside this particular hymn, you'll notice that it didn't make it into the Wesley hymnal because one particular preacher and Wesley couldn't look at each other's lenses, and so they said, ah, I'm not putting your hymn in my cool kids club book. Somehow it ended up here because we ended up having some united brethren, which were more closer to Baptists, come into the church, and then, eh, there you go, it's in the hymnal. Today is the first time I've ever sung that song as a hymn. Last night when I was finalizing the sermon, my kid's sitting next to me, and she's like, are we singing that one tomorrow? I said, no, we're not singing that one tomorrow. And she said, why aren't you singing that one tomorrow? I like it. Well, I had pulled my guitar out, and the 
kids like it when I play my guitar. My wife asked me, well, I love it when you play your guitar. Why don't you play it more? And I said, goals and destinations. I don't have time. I, I got to make choices. I'd rather coach basketball than sit and play my guitar. Da, 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 da. The kids like to pull out the cajon, and they like to play the musical instruments while I'm playing. They can't keep rhythm with whatever, so it's good practice for me to stay focused on playing rhythm. And I said, we're not playing that one tomorrow. I said, because songs change. And people hear them differently. And we talked a little bit about lenses. And I shared the Grammy performance of Tracy Chapman and Luke Donald. Yes. The country star who took Tracy Chapman's beautiful song, covered it, became something beautifully organic. It wasn't intentional. It wasn't produced. It started because he was sitting in his house during COVID, picking up his guitar and went, maybe I should play this. And his fans were like, that's a cool version of it. Now, he is a country white, completely opposite of what she was singing about. Completely opposite. If you don't know the song, feel free to download it. I think it's in the top 10 again. It's called Fast Cars. And the Grammy performance, if you don't know anything about Tracy Chapman, and, and I was sharing this with Katie and, and Maddie yesterday, like, Tracy Chapman went into a hole. She quit playing concerts, quit playing stadiums. She didn't want to play anymore. She went into a hole. She came out just to do this duet with Luke, and it's beautiful because both of them are singing the same song through two different lenses. Two different lenses, two different voices, two different backgrounds, two different cultures. And it's beautiful. Of course, Maddie recognized Taylor Swift standing up, <laughs> appreciating the moment. Taylor Swift makes it into my sermons two, 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 two services in a row. So Maddie asked me, she's like, well, where, where did you learn this song? Because I put on the hymn, the Come, Come Ye Sinners. I'd never heard the hymn version of this song. And I'd kind of like to know what it is before I come singing on a Sunday morning and throw all of you off. And because she is eight. I like your version better. It's like, okay, okay. Why don't we sing your version in church? I was like, because. This is a beautiful version, and it means a lot to the people who wrote it. It was an invitation, a town hall crier that you opened the doors, and, and people inside the church would sing out and invite people to come. And it means a lot to people who see this lens. The first time I ever heard Come Ye Sinners, it was at a youth rally, and a guy named Todd Agnew was not very famous. And I remember Todd because he was incredibly kind, and he was barefoot. He refused to wear shoes on the stage. It's the weirdest thing in the world. And we got a chance to play with him. And I don't think he had written the album yet. But I remember coming away with, I've never heard a song through that lens before. It sounds different, it rings different, it speaks different. It gives me a deeper appreciation to know that this song, which I knew came from somewhere, written in 1712, there's a longevity to that, isn't it? As we venture down our Lenten journey, going to invite all of us to look through different lenses, to be invited, to be uncomfortable, to be a part of the destination of being. And no, I have a gravelly voice and it'll make sense. And no, I don't have my guitar, so it might be an F sharp. You'll notice the lyrics are exactly the same. Come ye sinners, you poor and needy, you weak and wounded, sick and sore. Jesus ready stands to save you, full of pity, love, and power. Come ye thirsty, 
come and welcome. God's free bounty glorify. Because true belief and true repentance and every grace that brings you now And I will rise and go to Jesus And he will embrace me in his arms And in the arms of my dear Savior There are ten thousand charms so come ye weary you, heavy laden, you lost and ruined by the fall. And if you tarry until you're better, you will never come at all. 